22 words. 22 words have been swirling around in my head for some time now. 22 words have been opening my heart, convicting me, causing me to wrestle. 22 words are challenging me and causing me to face some real difficult realities. And I'd say ultimately to make some hard decisions. These 22 words, I, I kind of almost wish I could shake, but I can't. These 22 words are part of who I am today. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the case of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. I've been processing these 22 words. I've been thinking, what a great mission statement they could be. What if an organization set themselves upon these 22 words and it set the trajectory and the direction of which they went? Well, you see, these 22 words are more than just a mission statement. You see, these 22 words come directly from the word of God. These 22 words are found in the book of Isaiah, the Old Testament prophet. And I firmly believe that every word that's in here applies to us. That God speaks to us through his word when he allow him to. So I'm going to read those 22 words again. And this time I invite you, listen to these 22 words from the perspective of God speaking to you. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless and plead the case of the widow. Throughout the Bible, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, there are themes that we find woven in and out of every book. We read about the themes of God's love, God's forgiveness, God's faithfulness, his, his patience, his protection, his provision. And we read throughout scripture about the theme that we're going to talk about today. And it's the theme that is addressing widows and orphans. And this one verse Isaiah 117 could could truly be a six-week sermon series. We could break down every couple of words and, and spend an entire day on that. And it's all important and it's all valuable. Today, though, I want to focus on a few words in particular. And it is to take up the cause of the orphan. But before we get there, what I really want to be able to do is I want to redefine or clearly define, I guess, what I mean by orphan. Because I think often we have this picture of what an orphan is. And it's a picture of, of a, a, a poor child in, in Africa maybe whose parents died due to a war-savaged country or, or due to malnutrition or, or due to AIDS. And those absolutely are orphans. We just read on the screen that there are an estimated 8 million kids worldwide that are roaming the streets or in residential group care. Those absolutely are orphans. But I truly believe if you look at the Bible in its entirety, if you look at all that God wants us to look at, if you even look at the entirety of this verse, and we talk about the oppressed, we talk about justice, 
Your picture of what an orphan is, is is different, I believe. And a lot of it has to do with what their stories are. I want to tell you a story about a young woman who found herself unexpectedly pregnant in 1972. I don't know what words she used or what was swirling around in her mind, but I have this picture of if I parent this child, this child will be vulnerable. I'm not going to be able to provide for and protect this child the way this child needs. And at the same time, there was this couple. They longed to expand their family They figured that this was the time to adopt a child. They'd adopted one four years earlier, and now they were going to adopt again. And this young woman who was expecting a child was matched up with this husband and wife who were wanting one. And they connected. And the young woman decided that she was going to give her child to this couple to raise so that this child would not be vulnerable, so that this child would be protected and provided for and would have an education and be clothed and and be fed. And so she gave birth on August 14th, 1972. Just so happens that's my birthday too. I'm that child. A birth mom chose to give me to another couple so that I could experience everything that I've been able to in my life. When Pastor Kevin said, I'd like you to share what's on your mind, it wasn't hard for me to come up with that. Because you see, this message is 50 years in the making. This has been about my life, has been in my life and through my life, and I know without a doubt that this is what God wants me to share with you today. See, my story is just one of millions of stories, both those that are good and positive and successful, and there's millions that are still waiting to be written the way God would have them be written. I'm going to be very direct with you today. I absolutely believe that when God put throughout his word, take care of orphans, it was not a suggestion. I firmly believe that God calls the church, and the church is the people, to care for orphans. Now, we're going to talk about what that can look like, and it's not going to look the same to each and every person. But the reality is that we can't sidestep this. We can't say this is somebody else's job, somebody else's responsibility, somebody else will take care of it. We can't. So please hear that. This is the challenge God has placed on my heart to share with you today. These lives are important. These lives are ordained by God. Jeremiah 1.5 says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. This verse found in Jeremiah is an Old Testament prophet. And when God is speaking, he is speaking directly to Jeremiah. He's saying, Jeremiah, I got this message for you. I've got this purpose for you. I've got a use for you. But one of the things that I love is that we can take anything out of this book. We can take the the mistakes that people made and we can learn from them and not apply them to our lives. We can look at the conversations that God is having with individuals and we can learn from them. We can take the Proverbs and we can make wise decisions because of them. We can take Jesus' parables and learn from them. Or we can learn from a poem that we see in Psalm. But as 
God is talking to Jeremiah, we can apply what he said to him to our lives and understand that for each and every one of us, before he formed us in the womb, he knew us. He set us apart and he appointed us. Psalm 139, 16 says, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. I think for us as we're hearing this and I'm saying we can apply the the word of God to our lives, I don't want to miss out. And it's not just about us and it's not just for us. Last week, Pastor Brandon reminded us that we are known, that we are seen, and that we are loved by God. I need to say that again. I'm going to say it in a different order this time. That we are seen, that we are known, and that we are loved by God. That should make us feel good. That that should give us some some purpose to our life. We should feel good about that. And every single vulnerable child in this world is seen, known, and loved by God. But many of them have no idea. And I truly believe that's where we come in to the picture. We saw some statistics up on the screen a little bit ago, and and I think sometimes statistics can just seem so far off, or they can seem too much or or too, I don't know, vague. But I still want to do it, because I think it's an important thing for us to paint a picture by looking at some statistics. Currently, it's estimated that there are over 140 million 140 million orphans worldwide. 350 plus million children live in extreme poverty. In California alone, there are 80,000 children currently in foster homes. 6,000 of these children will never be adopted. It's called aging out of the system. 6,000 of those children won't have a family to permanently call their own. 6,000 of them won't have a child home, childhood home to, to go back to, to visit at Christmas and Thanksgiving. 6,000 of them won't be able to introduce their children to their mom and their dad the grandparents. I want to be clear here. I'm not trying to manipulate you with statistics. I truly am not. But these statistics are real. And each one of these statistics represents an individual, a life, a child who is seen, known, and loved by God. Currently in the United States, there are over 100,000 children who are waiting to be adopted. In the United States alone. This is 100,000 children who don't have a family to go back to. This is 100,000 children that if someone raised their hand and said, I will give them a forever home, they can make it happen. To put that in perspective, 100,000, that's more than the population of Carmel, Monterey, Pacific Grove, and Seaside combined. That many children in our country are waiting for homes. As I look at the statistics, and they are absolutely sobering and staggering, it seems like it might be something that's just too big for us to overcome. But the reality is that it just takes one person to change one of these lives. I asked the worship team to to sing that song that Lauren led earlier for the one. Because the reality is we don't need to be overwhelmed by the 300 plus million. But there's one. And I love some of the lyrics in that song that I want to read. Actually, I loved them all, but I'm only going to read some of them. Let me be filled with kindness and compassion 
for the one. The one for whom you loved and gave your son. For humanity, increase my love. Oh, how he loves us from the homeless to the famous and in between. You formed us. You made us carefully. Because in the end, we're all your children. I think as we're hearing those, song, those, that, those lyrics and singing that song, some of those can resonate with us personally. Like, ah, I'm God's child. This is amazing. Maybe we skip over the work on my heart so that I can be there for the one. But again, we're all God's children. Those of us in this room, those in the courtyard, those online and in the family worship venue, and those who've never heard the name of Jesus. A few weeks back, I was reading through uh, the Bible, and, uh, and I found myself in the book of Job. And I got to tell you, I don't ever find myself in the book of Job. Anyone ever go to Job when you're looking for some encouragement and to being uplifted? It's, it's not the book to do that. One, one year, a few years ago, I decided that I was going to listen through the Bible that year. And so I would listen to it on my runs. And I remember one run very distinctly. I was running through Badger Hills area of, of Fort Ord, and it went to Job. I've got to tell you, it did not spur me on. I wanted to go climb underneath a tree and sulk. It was not inspiring and encouraging me. But I ended up in Job. It was an interesting thing. I started reading Job 31. About halfway through, I started crying. I'm not talking like a little tear to my eye. Like my body started convulsing and I was shaking and I couldn't stop. And I was like, what is going on? I looked over to my wife and I said, I don't understand this. God made it clear. He wanted me to share Job 31 with you today. Job 31 convicted me in my heart that day. And I believe God will, will use it to speak to you if you'll let him. And specifically Job 31, 14 is where it got me. What will I do when God confronts me? What will I answer when called to account? I believe that's the question that each of us needs to ask. When we're being reminded today about this call upon the church, what are we going to do about it? What will I do? I, I encourage you over the, the next few minutes to to ask yourself that. As you hear me share a little bit more about the need, about what we can do, ask yourself and ask God, what will I do? There's a lot of scripture that talks about taking care of orphans. A lot of it, and I'm not going to overwhelm you with that, but there was one I, I didn't feel like I could skip today, and it's James 1.27. It says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. God looks upon caring for orphans or vulnerable children as a great demonstration of our love for him. I think when we look at what God calls us to do. Jesus himself was asked, teacher, what is the greatest command of all? And he said, love the Lord your God with everything you've got. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Pastor Kevin shared with us that we are to love God and to love people just last month. The way or one way in which we can show our love for God and our love for people is by caring for vulnerable children. So what's our role? What can we do? Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. 
God's made the way. He, he's, put, he's put the tasks out there. He's got the openings and availabilities there. He's got the works ready to do. If you're willing to step up and to step in, God will show you. He's got a place for you. And he has a place for me. And it all starts, I believe, with prayer. The first thing that I believe every single one of us can do is to pray. To ask God to show us how he wants to use us. To ask God to open our hearts and our minds. To to set aside the obstacles that we can so easily put up. The excuses that we can make. And to do something about it. Lord, I thank you that you uh, allow us to come to you at any moment. (laughs) Whether we're here in the middle of a sermon, in our car, at home, it doesn't matter where. Thank you. I invite you on behalf of each person that will hear these words to speak to us. To soften our hearts. To open our eyes. To show us how you want to use us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As I continued on in Job 31, I got to verse 17, and it said, if I, have, if I have kept my bread to myself, not sharing it with the fatherless, but from my youth I reared them as a father would, and from my birth I guided the widow. If I have seen anyone perishing for lack of clothing, or the needy without garments, and their hearts did not bless me, for warming them with the fleece from my sheep. There's a lot of words in there, but what I really get out of that is that when we see a need, we do something about it. So we can start with prayer and follow that up with giving. I said this a little bit earlier. Adoption isn't for everybody. Everybody can have their own role in this, though. Right? We all can do something. We all can pray without a doubt. And I firmly believe we can all give. And the ways that we can give are are different. And again, it depends on on where we're going to go. A little bit later, I'm going to talk about some partnerships that are ways for us to directly give. But you can give in many ways. You can give financially to support someone who is looking to adopt. You can give financially to help someone who's adopting. There's ways to give. You can give meals I got to tell you, over the the years that uh, I have been in this world, meals have been such a helpful thing. It's been an incredible thing to be kind of at the end of your rope in a day and not know what you're going to put on the table, but then know someone's going to bring you a meal. Support, just general support is huge. In Exodus, there's a, there's a story. And it's a story about Joshua leading the army against the Amalekites. And I want to read it. I want to read just a portion of it. And it's Exodus 17, 10 through 12. Because I think this gives a great picture of what support can look like in this world. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side and one on the other so that his hands remained steady until sunset. Moses, Aaron, and Hur partnered with Joshua, who was on the front lines, led by God the whole way. And with their partnership, with their support, each having their own roles, they defeated the Amalekites. Nine years ago, My family embarked upon the adventure of adoption. I have always felt from the earliest days of my life when I knew I was adopted that I somehow needed to adopt. And so nine years ago, we adopted. I gotta tell you, it's hard. It's hard for us as a family bringing someone in. It's hard for my son 
who he brought in. This isn't easy for anybody, but it's still right. I can't tell you the amount of days that we've needed support, that we've needed people to hold our hands up. And I'm talking all of us, family of six, me, my wife, my three daughters, and my son have all needed support. We've all needed investment in us. We've all needed people to hold up our arms, and we would not have made it this far without that. For some of you, that's how you can get involved. It's supporting those who are on the front lines, the, the Joshua's who are fighting the Amalekites. You also can get involved through encouragement. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 says, and let us consider how we can spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. For many years, my wife and I uh, have attended a, an adoption and foster conference in Washington State. It's called the Refresh Conference. And we haven't been there in a few years, but I gotta tell you, the support and encouragement that we have found there has just been amazing over the years. One of the greatest things is to be there with thousands of other people that are in our same position, to be walking down a hallway, to make eye contact with someone. And not a single word is said. But the message is loud and clear. I see you. You got this. You can do this. God's called you to this. Ending the conference every year. It's a tremendous experience of going through a prayer tunnel where lots of people are on both sides of you and just praying words of blessing, provision, of protection over us. It's always been just what we need to get us through the next year until we're back at that conference. That's something you can do. That's something each of you can do. Respite care, that's kind of giving a break to the families. Respite care is for both the children and is for the parents. And you typically have to get yourself certified to do that. You need to go through some classes. You need to be authorized to do so. But one of the greatest things is to just get a break. Some time to breathe. Some time to just... Think about other things or think about nothing at all. Children so often could use a mentor. And as I said earlier, I want to make sure I don't lose sight of this, that this isn't all about fostering and adopting. Those are a key demographic within the vulnerable children world, but the, the demographic is wider than that. Vulnerable children include those who are raised in single parent homes. As one parent is trying to get everything done without the support. I, my wife was gone last week, and I only had a few of my kids with me. And I was like, how do you do it? Like, people do this day in and day out, week in and week out, year in and year out. Their children are vulnerable. Maybe that's somewhere where you invest. Maybe you become a mentor a big brother, a big sister. Maybe you just spend some time with them. Our middle school and high school ministry and children's ministry are plenty of ways for you to get connected with these young people and help invest in their lives. For some of you, it may be becoming a foster parent. For some of you, it may be adopting a child. There's a lot of stuff that you can do. There are a lot of things out there in this world that you can do to make a difference. I encourage you, seek out God. Ask him to show you how he wants to use you and what way he wants you to be involved in caring for vulnerable children. I'm gonna quickly address one last piece and that's partnerships. 
The first partnership I want to bring up to, to mind is Safe Families for Children. And we actually have a representative, Janine, who's going to be out in the courtyard, and she would love to meet with you. I'm going to read how they describe what they do. They put together host families, family coaches, family friends, and resource friends to provide radical hospitality, disruptive generosity, and intentional compassion. They support in a way that allows families to be able to go through this process. I'll encourage you to go out there, go see Janine, find out some more information about this. In Job 3.21, it says, if I have raised my hand against the fatherless, knowing that I had influence in court. As I read this, I was brought to this organization that's called CASA. It's Court Appointed Special Advocates. And these are people who step in and speak up on behalf of kids who are going through the foster system. About 13,000 kids are currently represented represented by a CASA advocate right now in the state of California. I don't know if you remember, but I said about 80,000 kids are in the foster care system. That means well over 60,000 kids could still use a CASA advocate. Compassion International is, a, is an organization that we partner with, uh, and they do child sponsorship. Uh, and out in our courtyard, we have some packets that represent children who can be sponsored through this program. I would encourage you to go by the um, tent out there and find out more information about that. My family has had the, the privilege, and I really do mean that, the privilege of sponsoring children for a very long time. A few years ago, I had a chance to travel to El Salvador, and I got to visit a few of the projects that were there, and I actually got to meet one of the children that we sponsor. And I can tell you without a doubt that her life was different because of our sponsorship, that these kids get health care, they get education, they get food, they get clothing, as well as their families that benefit from this program. I neglected to bring this up last service uh, because it was in the bottom of my list and I ran out of time, but I have to do it this time. One of the most vulnerable groupings of children that we have are those who are being exploited worldwide. I'm not going to get into all of the details of the exploitation. You know what it is and you know what's out there and you know what's possible. And many years ago, I was introduced to International Justice Mission. Because I felt like I can't make a difference. I can't go rescue a child in Thailand who's being trafficked. But the reality is that I don't have to. Because International Justice Mission, among others, does that. But I can support them to help equip them and their teams to go do that. That is a vulnerable, vulnerable grouping. Locally, we have an organization called Set Free Monterey Bay that helps young women who are involved in trafficking. And that's another way where we can partner and get together and help out. Internally, we do a Christmas party every year called the Hope Christmas Party. And it's where we offer a Christmas party to women and children who are in shelters, locally here in the Monterey area. Highly vulnerable group of children that are being raised in the shelter most often because their moms had to escape a dangerous situation. But we have an opportunity to come alongside them, to offer them some hope during the Christmas season. And also during the Christmas season, we partner with Prison Fellowship and we do what's called Angel Tree. It's where we buy gifts and then deliver them to children who have parents who are incarcerated. If you weren't aware of this, one of the highest vulnerable groups of children we have are those who have one or two parents who are incarcerated. They often find themselves left to fend for themselves. They find themselves getting into drugs and alcohol and crime and gangs because you see, that's how they feel seen and known and loved. But what if they were reminded of or told for the first time that they're seen and known and loved by God. There are so many ways for us to care for vulnerable children. Would you please, would you please pray about, would 
Would you please process, discuss with your spouses, your friends, what role you can have. I got to tell you that, as I said, I was reading Job 31, and I got really emotional because I felt convicted. Because you know what? I think I've kind of worn a badge of honor for the last nine years that I adopted a kid. I did my job, right? I answered it. And I'm feeling like that's not all I'm supposed to do. That's why God put this message on my heart today. Because I believe that I'm supposed to start something bigger to, to help others, to equip others, to encourage and support others. And I can't do it alone. I can't even do it with the support of my wife and the two of us doing it together. We need more people. But how amazing would it be if Shoreline Church had something where we were known for equipping families and individuals to care for vulnerable children here in our community around our country and around the world. I want to invite you to be involved in that. So I'd love to have some emails coming my way. And I'm going to say right off the bat, I expect to have so many emails that I'm not going to be able to get back to you right away. My email is keith at shorelinechurch.org. Whether you're here on campus or uh, at home, I said it wrong. That's my old email address. It's keith at shoreline.church. Although if you did the other one, it would get there just the same. I'd love to have you say, I'm in. I'd love to help. I have absolutely no idea what that means and where I would do it and when I would do it and how much time I have, and that's okay. But I'd love to start the conversation. I'm gonna put together some gatherings with some people so we can figure out what this looks like. And in the meantime as well, if you would go check out the booths in our courtyard, if you'd go to our website, on our website there's a long list with links to all of the organizations that I've mentioned, plus more. But please don't leave determined to not do something. Please leave here with an openness to do something, whether you're here on campus or you're going to log off at home, please don't without turning to God and asking him, how does he want to use you to make a difference for vulnerable children? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for the uh, pull on my heart to, to adopt I thank you for all those others who have stepped in in whatever the way is to help exploited children, to foster, to adopt, to mentor, to feed, to clothe, to offer respite and meals. There are so many ways that you use us. I thank you for those who are already involved. And I thank you in advance for those who are going to step up and do so. Father, I pray not for reputation's sake, but for fulfilling your call on the church's sake, that Shoreline Church would be known for caring for vulnerable children and however you lead us. And pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before I uh, send you out with a word of blessing, just want to give you three invitations and really build off of what Pastor Keith said. Number one, if you're here on campus, out in the courtyard, we have three organizations that are out there, and you'll see that up there on the, the screen, we've got the Safe Families, we've got Operation Christmas Child, and Compassion International. And so if you've been praying and processing and the Lord's been stirring something in your heart, please, please, please take the opportunity to stop by and have a conversation. Just take that one step and have that conversation with some of those organizations out there in the courtyard. And for those of you who are online and not able to be here with us today, if you did, as Keith said, if you go on to our website, we've got some resources for you. But also in that Sunday morning email you received this morning, you can click on those links and you can find out more information 
information as well. And as Keith also mentioned about the importance of prayer, uh, here at Shoreline Church, we believe in prayer. We love it when people come to us and ask for us to pray. It's an honor and a privilege for us. So this morning, if the Lord, if there's something going on in your life, a great joy or maybe something you're really struggling with, we would love to pray with you. So if you're here on campus, we'd like to invite you to come forward here in the worship center. Our prayer teams are standing by and they'd love to pray with you. If you're out in the courtyard, we want to encourage you. We do have a prayer partner out there. They'll pray with you out there. As well as if you're online, we'd love to have you go ahead and just, uh, you can call the number on the screen. Somebody's standing by ready to pray for you. Or you can send an email right there to info at Shoreline with your prayer request. And we'll have someone pray with you and pray for you. And of course, for those of you who are new, especially for those who are first time guests at Shoreline Church, thank you again for being here today. We're honored that you chose to come and worship with us today. And so we want to encourage you, if you're new, would you swing out this, the doors through the worship center here and out there into our connection center and just say hello, let them know you're new and they'd love to give you a free gift and thank you for coming. For those of you who are online, if you just want to text the word welcome to the number on your screen, we'd love to just say thank you for coming and provide a digital connection card for you. And so if you are able, if you're here on campus or you're watching online or out in the courtyard or family worship venue, please stand if you're able, receive the blessing. So as you go from this place, go in the power and the presence of the one who calls you, the one who loves you, and the one who has a plan for you to go and be his ambassadors for the ones, the vulnerable ones, and all those who have yet to come to know him. We pray this and send you out in his blessing. We pray in Jesus' name, amen? Go and have a great weekend.